God is good? And all the time? God is excellent indeed. I'm so happy that I get to speak for another round this evening. Yesterday was a great day. It was a blessed day. Our praise team came and changed the whole game yesterday. They sang some lovely songs, and they continued that on this evening. Not only that, we also had a wonderful service as we had so many visitors that came to Columbus, Ghana to witness the youth revival. But as you all know, I am so excited that you all came back this evening to hear the word of the Lord being faithfully preached again. Yesterday, on Friday night, we started with our sermon, The Struggle is Real. Yesterday, our sermon title was called The Real MVP. And today, my message, which you all are about to find out in a few minutes, is called On Whose Terms? On Whose Terms? terms. Now, as you all know, why did we pick the theme, the struggle is real? As you all know, this is a common theme that is used among us young people and perhaps some adults as well. When things are not going right in your life, we usually say the struggle is real. But I want to attest to you all that though the struggle is real, there is no struggle that is greater than Jesus Christ. Can we say amen to that? But today, I want us to take a different twist. Because some of you have been in here and have been wondering, well, preacher, you said that the struggle is real, but there is a God. You showed us that on Friday evening. And then yesterday you showed us the struggle can still be real, but there's a God who will accept you despite the struggles that you have. And then on top of that, last night or last evening, we talked about how your faithfulness to Christ, you can still see a struggle in your life. We use Acts 16 verse 25, and I lifted the message from there. But this evening, where I'm going to lift my message on, because my message is entitled, On Whose What? On Whose What? On Whose What? On Whose Terms. Columbus got to make sure you are with me this evening, because you definitely don't want to miss tonight's message. Some of you are wondering, how do I stay committed to Jesus Christ, right? There's no brainer that one of the most difficult things to do in life is to stay committed to Jesus Christ. So tonight, the answer or what I want to provide to you is how you can stay committed to Jesus Christ, though the struggle is real. So my text this evening will be lifted up from Luke 9, verse 57 to 62. Luke 9, verse 57 to 62, and I'm going to read it in your hearing. The word of the Lord says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And then in verse 58, Jesus replied to the man, foxes have dens and birds have nets, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And then 59 said, he said to another man, he said, follow me. But this man replied and said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Then Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And then as I concluded up, 61 said, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And then we're going to conclude it off with verse 62. It says, Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I want you to turn to your neighbor on your right and say, on whose terms? And then turn to your neighbor on your left and say, on whose terms? Then turn to your neighbor behind you and say, on whose terms? That is right. That is right. Let us get right into the message. And as you all know, anything highlights you, just make sure that you use the hashtag, the struggle is lit. Let me just read some of the hashtags that have already come in. Somebody from yesterday's message um, quoted this tweet that I said. It says, God's love is a necessity, not a luxury. Another person also retweeted and said, your condition should not discourage you even if there is discouragement around you. And then um, my, at my dreams first said, the real measure of a man is whether or not they'll praise God in the good and in the bad. That's a good one. I like that one. And then another one here says, we focus on the crisis and not on Christ. So thank you all for tweeting and keep on tweeting, Instagram, live, Snapchat, whatever you want to do, because we want to make sure the word gets out. So let's put Luke 9 verse 57 to 62 into context. So as we see here, allow me to dramatize tonight's sermon. Allow me to, let's use our imagination for tonight's message. So 
I'm going to talk about three people that go on a job interview. Three people that go on a job interview. Now, these three people happen to be walking along on the road. Follow me as I take you through this journey. They seem to be walking on the road, and then they notice a job posting by Jesus Christ. This is what the job has. The job says, you do not need no application. Because on the first line, I said, God's call is not based on a submitted application, but a personal invitation. So the job post and said that there is no application needed for this job. And then the second job posting says it is an open interview because when you're called by Christ, you don't need to submit an application. So the, t- so the posting says an open interview. And then the last thing about the job posting, it says that no experience is needed. So let's re- review the three things here. They said, well, number one, for this job posting, there is no application. Then what's number two? What does number two say, everybody? open interview. And then number three says, no what? No experience. So this is the job posting. So I have these three people that go on a job interview. Actually, I'm incorrect. I misled you all. There's Four people that go on this job interview. Use your imagination. Four people go on this job interview. I couldn't think of any creative names, so I chose Akeem, Letitia, Afro Thunder, and a mystery figure. So these are the four people that go on this job interview because they see this posting and they said, look, I need some dollars in my pocket. Young people, you know we broke. Any dollars that we can get, I will surely take them dollars. So these four people are trying to get some money. So they look at this job posting and they decide to go into the interview. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens in this interview. Are you all ready to find out who gets the job? Who do you think will get the job? Anybody? Shout some names. Who do you think will get the job? Akeem, Letitia, Afro Thunder. Shout some names. Afro Thunder. Who else? Letitia. Who else? Okay, let, let's do a raise of hands. Who thinks Akeem will get the job? Man, only a few people. My, my, my people over here don't believe in Akeem. All right, no problem. Who believes Letitia will get the job? All right. I thought all women would have their hands up. All right, no problem, no problem. Who thinks Afro Thunder will get the job? All right, all right. My brother's in the back. My brother Joseph and them. All right, no problem. All right. And how about the mystery man? Do you think the mystery man will get the job? Okay, some people think the mystery man will get the job. Well, I don't know who's going to get the job. Let's see what Scripture tells us. All right, so Scripture says this is the first candidate. We have Akeem. Akeem is first up. It says, the text says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, uh, Jesus is conducting this interview, and this man says, I will follow you wherever you go. There is something wrong with what this man is saying because this statement right here will possibly not lead him to the job. He says, I will follow you wherever you go. Mm, what's the issue in this man's case, right? We see that in Luke 9, Luke 9, there's a series of events that goes on. But before I even go into his issue, this is the first one I want you all to understand. Tweet this, Snapchat this, do whatever you need to do with this. One fights for a job opportunity is at times not dependent on the person's necessity of the job, but the reputation of the job. Mm. What does that mean? Some of you are looking lost. Let me explain that to you. One's fight for a job opportunity is at times not dependent on the person's necessity of the job, but the reputation of the job. What does that mean? In Luke 9, we figure out that there's a series of different events that Jesus does in Luke 9. We see that in Luke 9, Jesus sends out the disciples. We see that in Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. We see that the, in Luke 9, Jesus answers the Samaritan woman's opposition. So we are looking at Luke 9, and some onlookers. Some individual will see that, hmm, if Jesus can heal, if Jesus can fill 5,000 with only a couple of items, then this is somebody I must follow. He's seen everything that Jesus has done up until that point, and he's like, hmm, well, I see what Jesus has done, so I'm going to this job interview because I want to follow this man wherever he goes. But there is an issue, because I want you to understand here, one's fight for a job opportunity is at times dependent on the person's necessity of the job, not on the person's necessity of the job, but the reputation of the job. What does that mean, right? When I was in ninth grade in New York City, as soon as you turn 15, you can start working. 
So I was like, man, this is my time to get a job. You know, I never had no money, and I was like, I could finally buy whatever I need to buy. So I decided to see what job I can get. And mind you, I was around 15 at this time. So I was like, what job can I get? So there was obviously the McDonald's, the Taco Bell, the White Castle, the various kind of different job businesses that I could get into. But I realized that if I go into some of these jobs, they possibly won't have a great reputation. What job would have a great reputation? So I was looking around, and the opportunity came for me to work at the district attorney's office in Queens County. This was in ninth grade. So I was weighing out the, the different jobs around, I was like, look, if I work at the district attorney office, it is much more of a higher reputation than Taco Bell, than McDonald's, than Burger King. If I was to work at the district attorney's office, I will be getting cash every single week. If I worked at Taco Bell or Burger King, I will be getting about $6.25. That was minimum wage at that time. So I was looking and weighing at the opportunities. I realized that if I work at the district attorney's office, I will get much more money. I want you to understand something this evening, ladies and gentlemen. One fight for a job opportunity is at times dependent on the person's necessity of the job, but the reputation of the job. Because I realized that if I worked at the district attorney's office, I would gain a lot more benefits. So we can understand here that I understand why this man wants to work for Jesus. But then I said there is something wrong with this statement. He says that I will follow you wherever you go. Don't miss this. It is a major problem. A lot of people say this. I will follow you wherever you go. As you can tell here, the person, if my English majors, my English Nazis, if you look at the English language carefully, it says I will follow. The key word will is used in the future tense, but not in the present tense. Mm. That means that he wants to follow Jesus, but not now. Oh, so, some, somebody not with me. Let, let me help you understand. Let me help you understand here. The reason many don't want to commit to Jesus because Christ looks good, but comes with too much baggage to handle. Right? Because he's like, I want to follow this Jesus. He has fed 5,000. He has healed so many. But he says, I will follow you wherever you go, which is in the future tense. And this is how Jesus responds to it. He says, Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What is he trying to say here? He's trying to say exactly what I want to say this evening. A lot of people want to follow Jesus. They really want to commit to dedicating their life to Jesus Christ, but they're not willing to bear the cost of what it will handle to follow Jesus Christ. Because what happens here is that a lot of us like Christ. A lot of us always come to church, but we are not sure if we want to commit to Christ because there's so much baggage that comes with Jesus Christ, right? Some of us have seen that Jesus Christ is good for us, but Jesus Christ won't allow me to go to the club. Some of us see that Jesus Christ can take me out of a car accident, but if I follow Jesus Christ, I still won't be able to do what I want to do. I want you to all understand this evening. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you must be willing to bear the cost. Can I get an amen? amen? Because this man says, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus is like, mm, nah, that doesn't sound right. Foxes and dens have birds to lay, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. My question this evening, some of you have seen the miracles Jesus has done in your life, but you still don't want to commit to him. Because you don't want to bear the cost. Some of you want to follow Jesus, but afraid of how your friends are going to make fun of you. Some of you want to follow Jesus, but you still want to be too cool enough to hang out in the world and also follow Jesus. This person says, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus looks at him and says, you're lying. Because foxes have dens and birds have no nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Are you willing to bear the cost? Are you willing to follow Jesus Christ despite all the baggage that's going to come with him? You see, I understand here is this. When you see a pretty girl, right, you always got to calculate. You always got to calculate when you see a pretty girl, right? A pretty girl can come with a lot of expenses, right? Am, am I lying or not? A pretty girl could come with a lot of expenses. A lot, she might want, if you go on a date, she wants a five-star meal. She wants you to spend a lot of money. She wants you to spend a lot on her, on her clothing, on her baggage. She wants you to spend a lot with her. You see, 
once we see that in a woman, we don't want to be with that woman because she has a lot of baggage with her. It's the same way with Jesus Christ. A lot of us don't want to follow Jesus because there's so much baggage that comes when you bear Jesus' name. Mm, let me help you understand. Maybe you all didn't get that illustration, so let me help you understand. You see, in class or in school, there's something called a GPA. Now, a GPA, you have to be very smart about your GPA because sometimes if you have a tough semester, you need to know where you should be taking your easy classes to get an A. You see, the whole thing here is this. The class could be easy, but you might gain no knowledge. The same thing it is with Christ. We sometimes try to take the easy route in following Jesus Christ. But Jesus tells the man, look, foxes and dents, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. This man is not a likely candidate to get the interview or to get the job. The reason is this. To be committed to Christ is to let go and let Christ reign in your life. That, that's, what, that's what you need to do here. If you want to fully be a part of Jesus' kingdom, you can't walk on a thin line. What you need to do is let go of the baggage of this world. Let go of the things that occupy your time. And understand that if you want to follow Jesus Christ, you got to let go and let God reign in your life. But there's something else I want you to understand with that illustration here. You see, letting go is very hard. You see, I'm a man, I love to dress. I love fitted suits. My suit has to be fitted exactly to my body measurements. Everything needs to be coordinated. So you see, I went to Ghana, and now Ghana... Uh, people obviously have lesser needs than us in certain parts. Don't get me wrong, you have a lot of rich people in Ghana. But in certain parts, people have lesser things than you. So when I always go to Ghana, my cousins always do something that's always very interesting and funny. This is what they always do. On the last day when I'm in Ghana, they always come up to my room. They, they're acting like they want to say goodbye or something of that nature. But this is their trick. Watch this. They know that there's a lot of stuff I'm going to throw away. So they come in there and they say, ah, uh, so Kofi, ah, uh, the tie. What are you going to, do you still need it in America? And I look at them like, man, I, I, I can't get this up. They have less than me. You see, what happens here in Ghana is that, People want to take your stuff. So they'll come to my room, they will search. Okay, Kofi, how about the watch? Man, I don't think you need the watch. Man, there's so many watches in America. You could definitely get a new watch. You see, it's hard to let go of these things because I'm like, man, I put my own money into buying these things. I put my own work and ethic into buying these things. Why should I let this go? But I realize that when people have lesser than you, it is always a joy to give back. And I want you to understand this evening. Let go and let God reign in your life. But then there's something else. This, 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 this man doesn't seem like a likely person to get the job because he's not sure if he wants to follow Christ because he doesn't want to take the baggage of Christ. So let's look at Letitia. So Letitia goes for the job interview and sits down. Jesus says, well, um, or Letitia says, follow me. Lord, First, let me go and bury my father. Everybody understands what happened here, right? Man, man, we can use it in a, a general context here, so don't be worried about that. The, te- the Jesus said to another, he said, follow me. The teacher said, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. Huh, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. Jesus is actually telling this person, follow me, Right? Jesus is giving this person an invitation. Follow me. But Letitia in the job interview says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. There's there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. Let, Let me tell you what's wrong here. Christ invitation is not an emergency that is met with a sense of urgency. Mm, what does that mean? Christ is telling this person, follow me. Be dedicated to me today. Commit to me today. But then Letitia says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. What is happening here is that what Letitia sees and what I want you all to understand this evening is that her priority was not Jesus Christ. Let me help you illustrate that. You see, 
After I graduated from Walla Walla, the great Walla Walla University, I worked at a company called Yelp. Yelp is on your smartphones. If you're ever looking for a business in the area to go to, Yelp is the place that you usually use on your smartphone. So Yelp is a major co corporation in America. So I had the opportunity of applying to working at Yelp, right, in Manhattan, nice place, nice office. So I applied to this place. Now, everybody, I want you all to understand this because this is something you need to understand and understanding what went wrong with this person's interview. You see... When I interviewed with Yelp, I told them, you know, I'm, I'm definitely delighted to work at this job. I told them everything an employer needs to hear. Now, check this out. When you apply for a job, they're usually going to ask you a question, when would you like to start? Now, if you say you want to start in three weeks, that could hurt your chances of getting the job. If you say you want to work maybe after I come back from vacation, that will hurt your chances in getting the job. But when the interviewer asked me, Kofi, if you get hired at Yelp, when do you want to work? I said, I will work as soon as you tell me I get this job. I want you to understand this evening. And following Christ, you must understand you cannot make Christ a secondary priority, but a primary priority. Because you must understand that Following Christ must be a now decision. You see, some of you want to wait until you're done with high school to go and follow Christ. Some of you feel like you don't have the maturity to follow Christ. But I always don't understand that logic. You see this? Because a lot of people say, I need to get things right before I follow Christ. But if you needed to get things right, then you wouldn't need Christ. Y'all didn't understand it, right? Let, 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 me, let me help you all explain that. A lot of people say, I need to get things straight before I follow Christ. But if you needed to get things straight, then you wouldn't need Christ. Because what happens here is that we tend to make Christ a secondary priority, but not a primary priority. We want to say, hey, I want to go to college first. I want to get wasted before I follow Christ. I want to do everything that the world is doing before I follow Christ. I want to make sure that, hey, I'm still young. I don't have any children. I don't have a wife. I want to do everything before I have to reach that point in my life. I want to make sure that Christ is a secondary priority, but not a primary priority. But just like how it was when I was working at Yelp, when they said, Kofi, when do you want to work? I said, right now, that must be the same answer you must give in committing yourself to Jesus Christ. But then, I want you to understand something here. You see, there's a reason why some of us don't make Christ a, sec a primary priority, but we make him a secondary priority. Can I illustrate it here real quick? You see, in college, there's something called assignments. You know, all, 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 all my secondary students here, primary students here, or in my high school college students, there's something called a term paper. So you see, one time I was writing a paper for a class. Now, you know that in college, they love to give you a lot of homework when it's down the stretch, and they know that you got to study, right? I never understand why they do that. So the, per the professor says this term paper is due right at the end of the semester. Now, there's so many things going on at the end of the semester. You're studying for this class. You got a presentation, a project to do in this class. So what happened here? I procrastinated. Now, I want you to understand this here. In my term paper submission, there's a timer on it. So the professor said, you have to get it in by midnight. So I was like, huh. I looked at the time when I started the term paper. It was about 8 p.m. I was like, man, and this is a 10-page paper. I'm like, whew. Man, I don't know if I could get this done in the, in the given time. I don't know. Because what happened here was that I procrastinated in turning in this term paper. And check this out. If you were to submit it after midnight, it doesn't matter if it was 12.01, the teacher would deduct 15% straight off the paper. So I was like, man, I'm screwed. Even if it's 12.01, I cannot come up with an excuse and my grade will be dipped down to a B. So I was like, hmm, what am I going to do? So I'm working on this term paper. It hits 10 p.m. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It hits 11.30. I'm like, oh, snap. I got about 29 minutes left. Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? So I'm getting down right to the wire. I'm trying to edit it real quick. I'm trying to see, mm, is, this, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? It's 11.58. I go on, and you always know that something always terrible is going to happen as soon as it's the time. So I was like, Lord, please, please, Lord, don't let nothing happen to me. So it's 11.58. I go on the Dropbox. I click submit, 
Boom, it goes in 1150. Now I'm like, praise God, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Because I want you to understand this evening, a lot of times we procrastinate. When we want to follow Jesus Christ, we will put other priorities before putting Jesus Christ first. And I want you to understand this evening, in order to be committed to Christ, one cannot make Christ a secondary priority, but a primary priority. Some of us this evening... We don't want to follow Christ because we feel like we have a lot of time. Now, I don't know when Christ is coming, right? I don't know the day. But he could come tomorrow. He could come in two years, five years. But all I know is this. Wherever I am in my journey, I'm going to commit to Christ right now because I want to make him the first priority in my life. I want to know that whatever struggles I, have, I am going through right now, I know that when I come under Jesus Christ's leadership, Jesus Christ will help me through my struggle. Some of us are saying that, mm, I don't really know much about the Bible. I don't really have knowledge about jewelry, music, all these Adventist doctrines. I want you to understand this evening. Once you make Jesus a first priority, he is going to give you the knowledge and the light that you need. Because in order to be committed to Christ, you must make Christ not a secondary priority, but a primary priority. But then, let's go to my man Afro Thunder. So, Letitia doesn't quite get the job. The Afro Thunder, he, he, got, he got the Afro. He comes in, he sits down. Jesus was like, Afro Thunder, come on in. Cool. Afro Thunder stands up. You know, he's ready for the job. He added his, his little Afro. He, he makes sure it's straight, nice, clean. So he goes to the interview, and he says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back to my family. There's something wrong with this. He says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, I could make the same point that I made earlier that you need to make Christ a primary priority, but there's something else I want you to understand here. Because what I see here, and the third issue I want you to understand this evening, Christ was a good thing to the Afro Thunder, but not the best thing. Mm. Christ is good. I understand. Preacher, you've, you've been preaching about Christ. You've been preaching about what Christ could do for you. Christ could give me a man. Christ could make me do better in school. Christ will help me through my struggle. But the thing here is this. Though he understands Christ is a good thing, he doesn't see Christ as the best thing. Mercy. Some of us make this same statement either verbally or not. Because we see Christ as something good, but not the best. And I want you to understand this evening. Your frequent desires should not get in front of the Christ you are to follow. You see, you see the, the man says, I will follow you wherever you go, but let me say goodbye to my family. You see, what, what happens here is that some of us want to follow Christ, but we still don't want to let go of our clubbing life. Some of us want to follow Christ, but we, wanna, we don't want to let go of that brother that we are with who is no good for us. Some of us want to follow Christ, but we still want to indulge ourselves in the pleasures of this world. Some of us don't want to say goodbye to the pleasures of this world and say hello to Jesus Christ. In order to follow Jesus, the third issue is this. Your frequent desires should not get in front of the Christ you are to follow. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes the hardest choice is the best choice. It's not, it's not easy following Christ. I can, I can tell you, from, from, from the bottom of my heart. I've been in situations where I'm like, God, why is this happening to me? I'm like, God, I want to stay devoted to your word, but I can't read my devotion. I want to stay devoted to your word, but I can't get up and pray unto you. I want to get devoted unto you, but I can't seem to stand up for you when people seem to attack me about your name. This evening... Some of us make the same mistake. We say, I will follow Christ, but I need to say goodbye to my family. I will follow Christ, 
but I'm not sure if I can leave my Pentecostal family. I will follow Christ, but I don't know if I could leave that person that I loved in my previous or past relationship. This evening, your frequent desires should not get in front of the Christ you are to follow. Because I want to make you understand an illustration here. You see, I decided to work out one time. I really don't like working out, but I was like, you know what? I need to make sure that I, I, I shed off these freshman 15. So I was like, let me try and make sure I lose this weight. So I decided to start running. I decided to do running, you know, with the Nike app. So I started running, but working hard, working out is very hard, if some of you don't know that, because you may have a goal, but sometimes to reach that goal is a difficult thing, because when you're working out, results don't come immediately. See, when you're working out, it's also tough because you need to also go on a strict kind of diet. If you're going on a diet, you can't be having cake. You can't be having certain kinds of candies. You have to watch your calories. You have to watch all these different kind of things. So though I wanted to work out and burn off some of this weight, I realized that I couldn't give up some of these frequent desires that I love. I couldn't give up some of this fufu that I love. I couldn't give up some of this banku that I love, some of this macaroni and cheese that I love, some of this McDonald's that I love. But I realized this, in order to be committed to Jesus Christ, your frequent desires should not get in front of the Christ you are to follow. The third person doesn't get the job. The fourth person. Does the fourth person get the job? Scripture doesn't tell us. Scripture ends at the third person. Scripture ends at the third interview. So I'm wondering, who is this fourth person? Does this fourth person get a shot at this interview? And does this person walk away with the job? The three people failed. Now it's all up on this man. This evening, I'm here to tell you this. The mystery person... Is each and every one of you in here. The mystery person is each and every one of you in here. Because I realize this. I don't know how your story is going to end. I don't know what story is going to be written about you. I don't know what your legacy is going to be like. But I know one thing. When it's all said and done, I hope to see that we will all be in heaven celebrating and rejoicing because I want to see that we all decided to commit to Jesus, not in the future, but in the present. And I want to see us not making an excuse, but saying that we are going to follow Jesus Christ today. I want to see us that our desires is not going to cost us because we are going to follow Jesus Christ today. I want to see that we're not going to make Christ a secondary priority, but a primary priority. Because today, the fourth person, I don't know how his life is going to end. I don't know if he's going to give excuses that he's still in high school, so he shouldn't be baptized. I don't know if he's going to say, I still need to go to college and witness the experience. But what I know this evening, the fourth person can rewrite a different story from the first three persons. The first person, the fourth person this evening is you and I. Are you going to be committed to Jesus Christ? I'm going to tell you this evening, straight up. On whose terms? That was my sermon title this evening. On whose terms? I can't follow God on my own terms. I can't try and set my standards to follow God. I can't try and rational ways in following God. But I know this today. If I'm going to be on some kind of terms, some kind of contract, I'm going to be on Jesus' contract. Because this evening, can I tell you what Scripture has said about my Jesus as to why I'm going to commit to Jesus? In Genesis, it says that my Jesus is the creator and the promised redeemer. In Exodus, it says he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, it says he is the high priest. In Numbers, it says he is the water in the desert. In Deuteronomy, he becomes the curse for us. In Joshua, he becomes the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, he delivers us from injustice. In Ruth, he is our kingsman redeemer. In Samuel, he is our all-in-one. In 2 Samuel, he is our king of grace. In 1 Kings, he is our ruler greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, he is the powerful prophet. 
In Chronicles, he is the son of David that's coming to rule. In Second Chronicles, he's the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he is the priest proclaiming freedom. In Psalms, he's our song in the morning and in the night. In Song of Solomon, he is the author of the faithful love. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Obadiah, he is the judge of those who do evil. In Matthew, he is the Messiah who is king. In John, he is the Messiah who is God in the flesh. In Colossians, he holds the supreme position in all things. In Titus, he's the foundations of truth. In First Peter, he's our hope in times of suffering. In Jude, he protects us from stumbling. In Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. This evening, my question is this, as I come to a close. Are you going to commit to Jesus Christ? Some of you have been baptized already, but you fell off a little bit. Some of you have been baptized already, but you still got some frequent indulgence that you go through. Some of you have come to this church faithfully, not baptized, but are still wondering if I should commit to this Jesus. Whatever struggle, pain, or question that you have, I want to know that if you follow Jesus Christ, he will give you the answer to your problem. This evening, as I come to a close, are you going to follow God's terms? I want to make an appeal. As the praise team comes on up, I want to make this appeal this evening. That you have heard the message. You have heard about these three people that went to the job interview. They did not get the job. But the fourth person, the mystery man, we don't know. We don't know if he's going to get this job, this spot in heaven. But I know this. That fourth person today can rewrite their legacy today. They can make their decision today. They can say, no matter what, I'm in high school, but I'm going to give my life to Jesus right now. I'm in college, I still want to explore the world, but I realize Jesus is much more greater than that. This evening, as we all get ready to sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I want us to all rise up to our feet. In this moment, wherever you are, ponder on the message. Ponder on the message. And are you going to follow God's terms? Today, are you going to make that commitment to follow Jesus? You're still struggling. You don't know if you want to commit to follow Jesus. But you listen to the message this evening. And you realize that Jesus is the person you must follow now. As all eyes are closed, wherever you are, I want to do a special prayer of dedication for you all. That this week you're battling some things. You want to make that decision to commit to Jesus Christ now. You don't have all the knowledge, but you see something good about Jesus because he's the best thing. You want to make Christ not the secondary priority, but the primary priority. Commit to Jesus now. Wherever you are, I invite you to come to the front. I invite you to come to the front because Jesus is calling you. Wherever you are, eyes are closed. Come to the front so that we can pray for you. This evening, you've decided to commit and dedicate yourself to Jesus. As the youth praise team helps me out with the song one more time, wherever you are, I'm calling you to come forward so we can pray for you. At this moment, before I give the final word of prayer, May God bless you, my brother and sister. Whoever wants to yield to the call and struggling and want to make that commitment to Jesus, I invite you to come so that we can have a special prayer of dedication for you. Come to the front wherever you are. As we begin to pray, Jesus is calling unto you. At this moment, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for everything you've done for us. We want to thank you for our brothers and sisters who have heard the message this evening. I pray that, Lord, I believe that they have heard what it means to follow you and why following you must be a priority. I pray that, Lord, in their hearts, may they recognize you are the living hope. I recognize that, Lord, I want to pray for our brother who has come for the front, that, Lord, you be with him as he makes this decision to commit to Jesus. My brothers and sisters who are out there still struggling with their hearts, I pray that the Lord be upon you all. We praise in your holy name. Amen.